Should there be a sin bin in football? Well, both codes of rugby have one. So do handball and lacrosse. Ice hockey has one too, with its penalty box and power play. And it even exists in water polo. Whatever the sport, the dynamic is the same. For a certain type of offence, the officials can remove a player from the field, floor, pool or rink for a period of time, putting their teammates at a numerical disadvantage. So could something similar work in football? But more importantly, would it be good for the game? In August, Newcastle and Manchester City drew 3-3 at St James's Park. With the game in its final quarter, Kevin De Bruyne broke into space in the Newcastle half, only to be chopped down deliberately by Kieran Trippier. Initially, Trippier was shown a red card for his tackle, but upon a VAR review, that was downgraded to a yellow. And this was an incident suited to the sin bin discussion. You see, the tackle itself was probably somewhere between a yellow and a red card, but the case for an additional level of punishment, one more severe than a yellow and not as serious or permanent as a red, was made by it being a tactical foul. The principle that binds the many forms of tactical foul is that they are committed intentionally to prevent a move from developing. It might be to stop a breakaway or a numerical mismatch, but whatever the case, it involves a player tripping or tugging back an opponent and accepting a yellow card as punishment for nullifying the danger. Now, is that fair? Well, that's a matter of opinion. But the principle itself seems skewed because it amounts to an individual punishment for a foul that benefits the whole team. And in that instance, surely a collective sanction would be more proportionate. And that's why such incidents reignite the conversation about sin bins. As the game has evolved, it could be argued that it's outgrown its on-field punishment system and that going forward, referees need more tools at their disposal to create deterrence and discipline offenders. And it's a fair perspective, but it's only theory. Any effect sin bins might have on tactical fouling would be guesswork. As for its impact on another part of the game, however, there's useful data to suggest that temporary dismissals would serve football well. Back in 2017, the International Football Association Board IFAB, gave national associations the right to introduce sin bins at grassroot level and also offered them the opportunity to choose which offences would be eligible for temporary dismissal. In England, the Football Association opted to run a pilot scheme in the 2019-20 season and use sin bins solely to punish dissent shown towards referees in amateur leagues. The results were interesting and were shown to produce a 38% reduction in dissent. In addition to which, the scheme produced a positive response among those affected. 72% of players and 77% of managers wanted sin bins to continue and 88% of referees were in favour. In the report, it was also noted that player behaviour had generally improved and that the trial had showed players self-policing the game to prevent their colleagues from getting into trouble. So far, so good. It also showed that the sanction worked as a deterrent, and the logistics were simple too. A sin bin player would be shown a yellow card but then be pointed off the pitch by the referee. The pilot scheme didn't involve designated sin bin areas or penalty boxes, but those would obviously exist were it to become law in the professional game. Once 10 minutes had elapsed, the referee then waved players back onto the field, with the provision that if an already sin bin player committed another sin bin worthy offence, then they would have to be substituted and removed from the game. And it applied to goalkeepers too. It's unclear whether this happened during the trial, but in theory, a sin-binned goalkeeper would either be replaced in goal by an outfield player or a substitute goalkeeper would need to be sent on, with the sin bin player then either retaking their position or playing as an outfielder. Those mechanics might need further work. It's also unclear whether any negative consequences were revealed during the trial, or how exactly such a change would translate into the professional environment. For instance, it seems certain that another level of footballing bureaucracy would lead to further fan anger, paranoia and the kind of negative behaviour that is hardly in short supply. On the field though, it remains to be seen how the period of numerical advantage could be protected from time wasting. While both codes of rugby use a sin binning system successfully, both sports also utilise a stopping clock. In football, by contrast, it's easy to imagine teams dawdling over restarts to erode a power play. What might happen if an injury occurred, for instance, or if the short-handed coach made a succession of time-draining substitutions? 
They are of course not insurmountable problems, but in addition to others, they are still issues which require thought if sin bins are ever to become universal footballing law. And that would be a decision for IFAB. In England, the success of the original pilot scheme saw it extended further up the pyramid to Step 5 of the National League system and Tier 3 in women's football. But extending further and further up into the football league system would require international agreement, further trials and the most significant change in the sport since the global introduction of VAR. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including David Ornstein, Daniel Taylor, Ollie Kay, Amy Lawrence, and Rafa Honigstein. There are journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.